Today, the president talks about America, its role, and how we will respond to the growing crisis in Iraq as ISIS militants continue to wreak havoc across the war-torn nation. President still saying no to putting boots on the ground despite calls for ground troops from House Republicans. Is this the right move? Well, tonight, we'll hear what two military analysts have to say about the chaos and what our limited choices may be. And we will head to Wisconsin, where Governor Scott Walker under fire tonight in what prosecutors are calling a nationwide criminal scheme. The Walker is accused of illegally coordinating fundraising with outside conservative groups. Is this another huge blow for the GOP? Plus, speaking of the right, prosecutors in New Jersey say they are closing in on Governor Chris Christie, thanks to some of Christie's key allies who may, in fact, rat him out for lighter sentences. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to RFL. A lot to get to in a busy 60 minutes. I'm Richard French, and thank you for joining us this hour. Tonight, we begin overseas in Iraq, where the violent and deadly attacks by ISIS are continuing to grow. The insurgency has fought its way across the country's northern region towards Baghdad, killing civilians and Iraq security forces along the way. Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki, he has called on the U.S. to launch airstrikes. However, U.S. military officials say launching strikes without killing civilians is virtually impossible. Well, today, after meeting with his national security team, President Obama laid out plans for handling this unfolding crisis in Iraq. The president saying, among other things, that the U.S. is ready to send 300 military advisors to Iraq. The U.S. also forming a joint operation centers in Baghdad and northern Iraq and boosting intelligence and surveillance operations. The president stood firm, though, and said the U.S. will not be sending in ground troops. In recent days, we've uh, positioned additional U.S. military assets in the region. Because of our increased intelligence resources, we're developing more information about potential targets associated with ISIL. And going forward, we will be prepared to take targeted and precise military action if and when we determine that the situation on the ground requires it. If we do, I will consult closely with Congress and leaders in Iraq and in the region. I want to emphasize, though, that the best and most effective response to a threat like ISIL will ultimately involve partnerships where local forces, like Iraqis, take the lead. Well, tonight there are conflicting reports over the violence taking place at one of Iraq's largest oil refineries. Iraqi government officials say the fight for the retire, uh, refiner excuse me, in Baji is far from over. By late this afternoon, Sunni militants and Iraqi soldiers both held control of two different parts of the key refinery that is located 160 miles north of Baghdad. Officials say that 40 militants were killed in the firefights and the fight for control of the oil has already prompted spikes in global oil prices. The crisis has leaders in surrounding countries across the Middle East concerned, and that's putting it politely. Israel fears the crisis may prompt concessions to Iran. Jordan dealing with a growing refugee crisis as people fleeing from Iraq pour over their borders. Syria in the midst of its own civil war and blames the U.S., of course, for ISIS's rise, saying it stems from America's inability to react decisively to its civil war. Saudi Arabia opposing what it calls meddling in Iraq's internal affairs. Leaders there say that this is Iraq's problem and they must sort it out among themselves. Iran, for their part, fears the crisis is being exploited by Saudi Arabia and sent advisors to Iraq. Turkey, concerned about oil after signing a 50-year energy deal to export Kurdish oil to the north. All right, a lot to discuss here. And for that, let's begin with our first guest, who is here to talk about all of this. And we are joined by Austin Long, now Assistant Professor of International and Public Affairs at Columbia. Austin also served in Iraq as an analyst and advisor to the multinational force Iraq and the U.S. military. And he is also the author of Deterrence, From Cold War to Long War, Lessons from Six Decades of RAND Research. Austin, thank you very much. I appreciate a few minutes. Thanks very much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. You know, when uh, we talk about 300 military advisors, there's competing um, thoughts on what that really means. I thought the president was pretty definitive today, but people say this is the first step in mission creep here. It can start as advisors, but it, in, it's a pretty way of saying boots on the ground. This is how it always begins till it turns into something more. Do you think it can be limited to this, or do you think it will turn into, in effect, 
a real military, American military presence once again in Iraq? I think it can be limited. We've seen uh, instances before. Uh, people talk about the campaign in El Salvador in the 1980s where we were limited to even fewer military personnel, less than 100 typically. So I think you can uh, keep things small, but you've also seen uh, other examples, Vietnam being the biggest one, where a small, you know, a small advisory mission becomes several hundred thousand troops. So I think this isn't inevitably a, uh, the beginning of a big commitment, uh, but it certainly could go that way. I think this administration uh, will do everything in its power to make sure that it doesn't uh, get much larger, though. Let's talk about ISIS for a second. These are bad guys. Um, even Al-Qaeda distanced themselves at one point, but they have connections, it seems, to the Al-Qaeda faction in Yemen. Give a brief synopsis for the audience at home who re may know the acronym, but they don't know who we're dealing with. Sure. Uh, ISIS, as far as we can tell, is more or less the, the descendant of what used to be called al-Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, for a while, it changed its name to the Islamic State of Iraq. And of course, now that the battlefield has expanded to Syria, it's added either, depending on how you translate things, it's uh, a, a, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria or Islamic State of uh, Iraq and the Levant. So it's a, it's a descendant of a group that, it, as you point out, was uh, always seen by, by al-Qaeda Central, uh, particularly Zawahiri, uh, as, as being too extreme and pushing the, the sectarian war agenda uh, much harder than even al-Qaeda was comfortable with. So uh, it's, a, it's an extremely powerful organization um, in, in terms of its organization. It's not huge, but it's very well organized. Um, they were extremely effective just when they were fighting in Iraq. And of course, the war in Syria has re-energized the flow of foreign fighters that had died off in Iraq. So it's, it's in some sense uh, al-Qaeda in Iraq back again uh, stronger than ever. Uh, and then they have a lot of local allies, and that's something that's not talked about quite as much is uh, disenfranchised Sunnis in, in Iraq, people that don't necessarily sign up for, for the ISIS agenda but feel like they've gotten a, a bad deal from the, from the Iraqi government. Um, and then in the mix, you also have former Ba'athists, folks that uh, the U.S. took from power in 2003 that fled to Syria uh, and now see this as their chance to make a comeback in partnership with ISIS. So ISIS is the, the spearhead, but it's, it's not just ISIS that, that we're dealing with here.